Good afternoon. Welcome back to the session. This is the last final session, the technical session of the LTC 2022. And the theme of the session is research data services. Essentially, this is a session where the onus of responsibility shifts to the typically the library information science profession because this is here we are going to understand and ask you what you have done, what you can do, and what you are going to do. Because research data services is the service part because today everybody is talking about we moved from information services now to data services. So the LIS profession is tasked, I would use the word tasked, or we can even say, can claim a role in this research data management, provided we are all ready to offer research data services. So in this session on research data services, we have with us today Dr. Andrew Cox, who is a senior lecturer at the Information School in the University of Sheffield. Dr. Cox, one of his major focus of research naturally is about the response of the information profession to the changing landscape of whether it is introduced by the ICT, whether it's introduced by the I mean, the current one that we are talking about, research data management, or any of this, and how do we build that kind of a workforce. Without further ado, I would like to invite, welcome and invite Andrew to give his views, and based on his experience of, you know, what services can be given, and how we are preparing, or how the world is preparing to train and educate the library information science professionals. So he's going to be talking about how we can be data library professionals. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you so much for agreeing to be with us and to share your experience and expertise with this audience. Thank you. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I hope you're going to enjoy this presentation. Um, it's a shame I can't be there with you, but um, what I'm going to talk about is yep, research data services, particularly from, say, a UK perspective. And I want to introduce what I was saying by sort of um, setting in the context of open science and the trend towards open science uh, more generally. So hopefully you can see my slides now. Um, so I'm from the information school. Sheffield in the UK. Uh, we see ourselves as an important uh, learning provider in the information and library space. Um, so in terms of the context for research data services, um, there's this rather good paper going back a few years which articulated that there's quite a lot of different views of what open science could mean. Open science could mean just sharing the outputs of research with the public more effectively. It could mean involving the public in the creation of citizen science, even involved in doing science. So even within Western notions of what open science is, I think there's some quite different views. And that's a really good starting point for thinking about, well, we're talking about RDM as the foundation for open science, but you know, what is open science? And um, I think we should, I'm going to talk a lot about the UK experience or the, the experience in places like the UK and Europe. But I think we've got to acknowledge that open science isn't going to be the same for everybody. What, what that should mean should differ across the world. So um, I'm sure we all know that the, the, the the global publishing system isn't particularly equal. Um, 
certain countries like America and indeed Britain, and I suppose I'm a beneficiary of it too, science is dominated by rich countries in the global north. And there is a question that's been raised in extreme forms in, say, Africa, South America, about epistemic justice um, and how this system excludes different ways of thinking. So I think the assumptions behind open science, as articulated commonly in sort of research data management, reflect global north assumptions and are based on the practices of Western science. The evidence is that the open data movement, things like the FAIR, which we've heard a lot about, I expect, in these sessions, was developed by global north scholars from their own perspective. But we know from the work of people like the Zudenhut in Africa that uh, scholars in less privileged contexts who maybe haven't got great bandwidth, haven't got the most up-to-date software, simply don't have the same time and resources that Global North scholars have, are disadvantaged if, you, if open science just means open data in a completely open way. So opening up data, open data sounds like it's inherently a good thing, but I, I would ask questions about that. And I think for Global South scholars, a bit of a sweeping terminology, for Global South scholars, they are vulnerable to sort of Global North scholars with more advantages, scooping them, and forms of data colonialism. So I think when we think about research data management, the whole point of what I'm saying is, I'm going to talk about what I know, which is the UK experience of doing RDM, but I don't know that this translates to other contexts, such as India, in a simplistic way. We've got to rethink what RDM should mean for your context. You've got to think about it in those terms. We can't just take Global North experiences and just uh, put it onto the Global South. So that's one point I want to make about context. The other point I wanted to make about context is now I'm talking about the UK experience. We're looking at a quite a complex agenda. So open scholarship, open science, open research, whatever you want to call it, um, is part of what research data management drives forward. But actually, in many ways, the point of RDM is just to help scholars themselves to look after their data better for their own benefit. It may not even be anything to do with sharing data, for example. Data sharing can come in many, many different forms. It can be sharing with a colleague. It can be sharing in a very controlled way. In other cases, it's, it's uh, completely open, but that's a bit unusual, I think. So I think, so in this diagram, which is like just a classic force field diagram, I tried to articulate, well, what are the drivers and what are the barriers or the challenges for doing RDM? in the UK context. So the bigger, the arrows push it, the green arrows are the things that are driving this agenda, this complex agenda along, and the orange brownie arrows are the kind of barriers. Now the, the, the main driver, um, so what I want to say with this diagram, I think is think about this how would you redraw it for your context? Because I've talked to a lot of people in, in places like the UK and every institution is a little bit different. And I think how they would draw this, what are the signs of the arrows is different in different contexts. But we can say that in the UK, funder compliance has been a really big thing. In other words, the funder saying you need to share data has been a big driver of all this area. But there's a lot of other drivers and then a lot of barriers and the biggest barrier is probably academic culture. Academics have got lots of things to do apart from worrying about data sharing. Um, and in many areas, in many areas of science, there is a, a desire to do reproducibility, but there's also many, many scientific areas where reproducing science 
is very uncommon. There's very little reuse culture. There's no reuse culture. If I don't reuse somebody else's data, I'm unlikely to want to share my own data. So this force field diagram tries to articulate this kind of clash of forces. And I was preparing this slide for today and I suddenly thought, oh, actually, I probably have to redraw this a little bit. So you probably can't tell the difference, but I've updated it slightly. And a couple of things that seem to have changed is one is the open science movement as a, a broad kind of, um, uh, well, as a movement that seems to have strengthened. So I've got the bigger arrow on the green side there. But another big thing I think is coming along that's really going to make, um, be a big driver is the use of data by um, in machine learning and other forms of artificial intelligence for space research. This is like a, a massive thing at our institution at the moment. So the need for data to reuse data, to manage data in the context of doing artificial intelligence based research is a really growing factor. So I've made that arrow there a bit bigger. And that's a bit of a shift. And I think that means a shift in what research data management means. Because maybe the requirements for data from artificial intelligence or machine learning or something like that are different from what we thought of as what the requirements were with R, with RVM, where it was more, I think, about you know, people, researchers collecting data, how do we make sure they manage that data within the research process effectively. But I think the pattern of what data people are looking for and uh, the need to acquire data is probably something that's kind of emerging as quite a big theme. So I would invite you to think about that diagram and redraw it, this force field analysis and redraw it for your own context, your own institution. And remember that, you know, it's, it's both, it's unlikely to look the same as it does in the UK. And it's also a little bit of a changing environment in which we're operating. So what RDM means, I think, is changing. And what research data services are changing. So in terms of explaining what I think research data services are, um, I'm going to go back to a survey we did pre-COVID which was um, in, in 2018, um, we, we circulated a survey to quite a lot of different countries, but all in the global north, I should say. Um, you can see there uh, some of the countries we contacted uh, and the response rates. We were asking one in response per institution. And it was a repeat really of a survey we'd done in 2014. So it gave us a little bit of a ability to compare how things were changing over time. But it's very much a global north centric kind of view of RDM. And because of the way, um, I think we should be, I think it's a useful survey to give us kind of hints about what's going on. Of course, it's a bit dated now. And also there's issues around the response rate in certain countries. But let's go with what we've got, which is this survey. And I just want to go back to this question about what are the drivers and barriers and, and what came out of the survey was that the drivers, the key drivers are for having research data services are compliance. In other words, mostly compliance with funders mandates to share data. Library capabilities, so the feeling that the library has the ability to offer something in this area and the perception that researchers need support because they're not very knowledgeable or skillful in research data management always. And the barriers in terms of well resources, are there any new resources to do this extra work? I remember I should say this is a survey of libraries, so it's libraries research data services. So we have other extra resources to do these RDM services. Then there's a bit of a barrier in terms of skills. Have has the library staff got the skills to do this? And the third area is uh, the engagement of academic staff, low engagement, low responsiveness. 
So we can build research data services, but it's still at this time, and this is quite a long time, 2018, long after this agenda first came into people's, you know, emerged, there's still a lack of engagement on, it, on the, in terms of academic. And this led me to kind of coin this like three paradoxes of, of research data services. Researchers need support, but there's no demand from them. So we can identify as librarians that researchers aren't necessarily understanding what they need to do in terms of managing their data effectively and sharing it effectively. But actually academics themselves are not demanding such a service. So there's researcher need, but not demand. Then there's a funder requirement as a key driver. And yet there wasn't much evidence that the funders actually um, check for compliance. So the funders say, oh, you must share your data, but there's very patchy evidence that they actually turn that into looking at what actually happens. And without that check, how far is that really a complete driver, if you like? And then the other thing is the library desire to be involved. So the library feels that it's something that they could take on board, um, but the problems in terms of the capabilities, do libraries actually have the skill set to, to do this? Credibility, um, do, do people see the library as a place to go to do RDM? No, they'll probably go to IT services first or research services first. So there's an issue of credibility and there's a resource gap. Libraries don't actually have extra resources to do this. So those are the kind of three paradoxes of RDM of research data services as I see it. Of course, the survey's done 2018, things have probably changed, but I have a suspicion that to a large extent, those things still would hold up. But it's an interesting question of how things are changing. Um, and I just to follow up a few quotes from people in the survey. So here's someone drawing a very strong contrast between what's the reason now to do research data services? Well, it's to promote integrity, reproducibility, trust in research, blah, blah, blah. In future, strategic and economic impetus for artificial intelligence. So again, it fits in with my perception. I mean, this I think is quite a, in 2018, I didn't really fully understand what this person was saying, but now I think I agree with them. It's the rise of um, data science, the spread of data science across a lot of disciplines was creating a new type of impetus for data skills, data support, research data services. Maybe we should talk about data services as a whole. Um, then there's some more. Um, this is an interesting one. The chicken and egg scenario of RDM remains. You have to have a service in place to promote it, but you can't fund developing a service until there's evidence of demand. So again, this is the this is a paradox that's existed a long time around. I mean, I think I first got involved in RDM about 10 years ago, but I haven't seen a dramatic revolution of research data services becoming accepted as, as normal even in that time period. Um, so there's some other quotes, but I won't go through them. Uh, on to really what are research data services anyway. So what are people, so this is perhaps the main point of my talk here is what are the current services provided by libraries? Bear in mind, there might be other research data services being provided by other parts of the institution. Um, and then we, we worked out roughly what's the kind of rank order. So promoting awareness of reusable data sources, such as data archives, 83% of the libraries responding were doing something in that area, maybe not much, but something. So it's just promoting awareness that there's data out there that you can reuse. Advice on copyright and IPR licensing, 80%. Data management training for data literacy instruction. So teaching people about RDM, 
80%. Then maintaining a web resource or guide on local, uh, on useful resources for RDM, about 80% again. So those are the top things, you know, it's telling people that there's other data out there and helping them find data. It's advice on things like copyright. It's training people about RDM, particularly research students perhaps. And it's providing a kind of web resource that people can go to and find out about research data management. Number five, um, there's two joint things there. Something about data management planning and data management planning is a key area where libraries have developed um, uh, services quite in, in a way that lies outside what they normally do. Data management planning is really giving people advice about uh, when they're designing a project, how they're going to manage data within that project and things about data citation also and data publication. So. You can see that these are all advisory services. Number 10 in the list is running a data repository. So things like a technical services, running a repository are quite low down the list. And then if we go even further down with things like supporting data analysis, data visualization, that's really low down the list at that time. But I think the shift towards artificial intelligence based research and data science research may have again, shifted the picture a little bit. Um, this is just showing how from 2014 when we did the first survey to 2018 when we did the second survey, which is the bl blue line is the 2018 survey, the level of service has risen a little bit, but it's not dramatic. Um, just a few, it's just saying the same thing. We developed at the time a bit of a kind of maturity model. Um, I'm a bit doubtful about the term maturity because, and to go back to the point I made at the beginning, I don't think the search data services in every institution should look the same. So saying what is maturity kind of implies a single path of development and everybody's gonna get there in the same way, which I don't think is true. So there's our maturity model. It's in a, published in a paper. If you want to look at that, it's worth, worth having a look at. But I wouldn't place much reliance on that. So I just wanted to, I'm aware of time, so I want to say a few other things. So I've given you a sense, a flavour of what key research data services are probably. That's from the library perspective, but in fact, I think everyone agrees that research data services are a collaborative effort and there's lots of people who might be involved in this. And I've worked a lot with different institutions and that's demonstrated to me that every institution is organised a little bit different, even in say one country like the UK. And how the history of that institution, how it, how it works and is structured, shapes um, shapes what the emphasis is in in terms of um, services. Um, okay. So um, I think research administrators, people who support researchers to apply for funding, they can have a role in training people, supporting them. Archives and records managers, because they're all about the long-term preservation of data and information anyway, often have a high level of skill that are relevant to developing research data services, particularly the preservation side of things. Obviously, IT services could be involved. Um, and then in UK universities, there's often a lot of IT staff embedded in inside um, departments who could also have a role in the search data management and researchers themselves, of course. So there's a wide range of people who should be involved in developing research data services. So I don't think we should just focus on what librarians do. That's one point. And then I just wanted to maybe nearly the end of the talk, but I also wanted to talk about, well, in terms of librarians, how do we sort of um, develop our um, 
services. What the data role spectrum really says is that the things that people, services that libraries provide tend to be the things that are very similar to what they already provide. So it's a, it's a translation of what you already do. So a common thing that people do in terms of research data services is training people. And that's because it's a data information literacy, if you like, is part of data uh, information literacy. If it's about managing a collection of data, like in a data repository, that's an extension of collection management. So not surprisingly, what librarians do in terms of research data services tends typically to be very much like what they already do. So because it's you've already got the skills, librarians have already got the skills to do certain things, that's why they do offer particular types of services and the resources required and demand also kind of shape, shape that. Um, and then just quickly to close, I mean, in the survey, we also asked about where are the skills gaps? Um, and we asked in these particular areas. So uh, again, you can have perhaps a closer look at this, but it's also thinking about where libraries are keen to do research data services, but there are quite big gaps in the skills. Managing data is a bit different from managing uh, other types of content. So um, we have to think about that. So just to bring the talk to a close, um, because I'm aware of time, and, and to kind of summarise what I've tried to say, my first question to you is like, well, what should open research, open science look like for your researchers? A, in your institution, but B, in perhaps a relatively low resourced context compared to the global north, and that maybe what open science should mean isn't the same as what has been defined by uh, scholars in the global north. Having thought about that, then it's worth thinking about what are the actual drivers and barriers locally to building research data to services and where we position our services will have to mirror that kind of evaluation of the drivers and barriers. And I think this can be pretty complex. I think it's changing over time. Uh, as I say, I would emphasize the shift towards um, machine learning as a uh, data science techniques in use across a lot of disciplines. This will help you identify, well, what are the research data services which are kind of long-standing priorities and which are likely to expand? And then we need to think about who's going to deliver these services. Is it the library? Is it the library in cooperation with uh, research administrators, with IT? And also thinking about there will be skill gaps. So how do we fill those gaps in skills? So that's my presentation. I hope it was useful. I'll stop sharing. And uh, I'll be very interested to hear what the rest of the panel respond to my points. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for giving your insight based on your survey and your study of the skill gap that exists between the kind of uh, services that is given and also positioning libraries as one of the our library information professionals as one of the uh, uh, stakeholders who can actually offer services provided they actually bridge this gap. In fact, let me confess here, I have been for the last uh, couple of years, two, three years, I have been talking about that, you know, this is the new frontier for LIS profession. Whenever I'm invited to talk about that and I use extensively your paper and the chart that you have given about the changing skill. That's the one that I use, which is published in the, I think 2017 Journal of uh, Association of Information Science and Technology. I use extensively and I also, of course, promote you. Recently, when I gave a talk, I said, 
Andrew Cox is the one who's, I mean, of course, I have cited it there, and I said he's going to be here giving a talk, so come and uh, join this uh, conference. So thank you so much uh, for giving this uh, insightful uh, talk. So now, the, are there any questions? Uh, sir, so thank you very much that? for uh, just showing us a place and uh, uh, play, uh, what roles the librarians can play into research data management and what are the competency gaps for us. Uh, but I have a question regarding a survey which you conducted. Uh, it seems to be predominantly dominated by Western part. And why a countries like uh, India, China, Korea, or Japan, who also contribute significantly into research and research data, were not covered into survey? Was it by design or was it by some other reason? And, and what could be a reason for a very low percentage of a response from a country like uh, Germany? who has got a maximum number of research institutions, but if we see the, uh, we see the data response, it's a very minimal. What could be a reason for that one? Does it mean people are not willing to give information from that side also, or the librarians are not responding to your questionnaire? That's a very, very good question. We did do a later bit of work with a scholar, a uh, visiting scholar from China. So we kind of extended the survey to China, but actually the evidence was libraries anyway weren't offering many research data services at that time it's like a couple of years ago just before the pandemic so um but ultimately the answer to your question is it's a failure on our part to do sensible research we we targeted english language universities because we're english-speaking scholars it's probably the response rate from germany was low because the survey was in English. And so I will hold my hands up and say, well, that's not very good uh, in many ways. I would love to do the survey globally, but that is quite challenging to actually achieve when this was an unfunded project. So um, the resources to do that simply weren't there. But I think it is a really, I think you picked up a very valid point. We looked very much at Global North um, institutions I think we have to think a lot more about what's happening in places like Southern Africa, including South Africa, but you know, Kenya, all these countries where I think conditions are very different. And I think what open science means there and what research data services look like will be quite different. I think they should be different anyway. So I, I, I wanted uh, my remarks at the beginning were really trying to sort of offset the, the point that you really made that this is quite biased research it just looks at one context and we should be looking much broader but I think we should be asking that about not just about research data services we should be asking that about what is open science and what is uh, in terms of epistemic justice of like recognising different ways of doing knowledge building that, for example, aren't following the model of Western science. Now I would like to invite our panelists and the anchor. The anchor for this session is Dr. Anand Bhairappa. Uh, he is with the Indian Institute of Science and then he's coming online. This is one change in today's format. Since, uh, so anchor is also online. And I would like to invite our panelists, Dr. Vishal Rao, Dr. Manjunayaka and Dr. Raj Bharadwaj. So Anand Bhairappa is the anchor for this session. So can I hand over the session to you, Anand? Okay. Thank you very much, madam. Uh, it's my privilege to be part of LTC 2022. And uh, so I would like to be very happy to be part of the last panel discussion because we also get a lot of knowledge by attending previous sessions and also previous uh, you know, <clears throat> keynote speakers. So if you really, uh, you know, if I look at uh, the concluding remarks of Professor Shalini, she said there are many stakeholders in research data management. So if I start from there, in my opinion, there are four major stakeholders are, uh, you know, uh, uh, in research data management. First, I would like to uh, say library and information science professionals. Second, computer science professionals. Third, statisticians. And fourth is domain experts. 
Now, if I connect back to Andrew's talk, uh, you know, when he was talking about uh, you know, uh, the skills and the gap uh, to manage research data management, if you look at this, you know, this, uh, the gaps he mentioned, many of them are really, uh, you know, familiar to us. In fact, we are already doing some stuff on that. So that way, I believe, uh, you know, uh, it's not going to be very difficult for us to get the services for our researchers. I think that's going to be the trend for all of us. And uh, it is not really unfamiliar to us. If you look at LIS, if you observe, we have always, you know, uh, proved, you know, we, we associate with new technologies, new tools, and we are long-term players in those domains. For example, if you look at uh, CDSISs, we went to that and we stayed there for 20 to 30 years. I don't talk about advantages and <laughs> disadvantages. That is one. And we really did good jobs in institutional repositories, e-prints, and uh, you know, thesis and dissertations management and all of that. From this point of view, I am sure that you know this is going to be our domain, or we can take a, we can really get in and bring in a lot of uh, you know value addition, and we can drive changes. And undoubtedly, that will be very useful to the institutions and also to the world. And it's it will significantly contribute uh, to the open science and all of that. So to talk more about this and also to help. Uh, Primarily, this you know, library information science professionals. We have very uh, three distinguished panelists. Now, uh, the structure we have been given is each panelist will talk about eight to ten minutes, generally about their views, and then once they complete that round of uh, you know, uh, looking at their views, then we'll pose one or two questions either from audience or from my side. Now, I would uh, like to request first. Uh, uh, <clears throat> First panelist is Rajkumar uh, Bharadwaj from St. Stephen's College, Delhi. So, Dr. Rajkumar, can I request you to, to uh, take over and uh, share your thoughts for eight to ten minutes? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Anand. And I'm also thankful to the chair, Professor Shalini Uz, and the organizers of this uh, conclave, especially Satyanarayana sir for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on this topic. So my experience of working in research data management is quite a few years old, actually, when I visited on a Commonwealth Fellowship to UK. And as a part of the Commonwealth Fellowship, uh, I had to visit several universities. In fact, uh, visited more than 30 universities in the UK and visited several data centers uh, in the country. And gradually, I inculcated in trust for the research data management. And after return uh, to India, first of all, I studied that what is the status of research data repository in the country. And we did an extensive survey uh, of the online data repositories which were existed uh, uh, online. So we tried to find out what is actually the status. But if you look into this, the whole concept of research data management, it is actually foreign to all of us because we borrowed it from the West. But as we did mistake in the institutional repositories, the everybody was actually after to you know customizing it, uh, learning the, about the technological part, and hardly actually we think about populating the data into the repositories. I think that part we should uh, be awarded into this aspect, especially when we are building research data management uh, repositories. So research data management as a whole is not just building a repository; it is much more than that. Much more in the aspect is that here, you as a library information science professionals are not actually accentuating the technology, but we need to actually advocate the researcher's concern. If I look into this subject, research data management, library role should not be actually technological oriented. Our role should be to advocate the concerns of the researchers. And we also need to think about what kind of a advantages, what kind of in incentives we can give. So at what pa one part, we need to educate the researchers' concerns, which is think about the ownership of the data, scooping of research data, and misinterpretation of the results. These are the main primarily concern, and one of the very extensive study conducted by the Voile. These are the three major concerns they found from the researcher side. So if you are actually thinking to have a research data management 
in your institutions. Don't think it's only about the research building a data repository. It is much more than that. If you look into the research data management system and the data generated by the researchers in the lifespan of one PhD research, on an average, one researcher create one terabyte of data in the PhD lifespan. So don't think it's a, we can solve the problem by building a data repository. It's much more than that. Apart from that, how you can mediate with, between the researchers' concern and how you can actually uh, advocate for building a data management system that you need to advocate that the data will remain accessible on the internet. Data will be in a publishable state when you are actually a researcher and the, one of the objective of doing research is that I want to get a more visibility uh, among my peers. And when your data, researcher data will be visible on the internet, uh, and it is in a publishable state, obviously people will come forward and they will contribute the data into it. And obviously, when you are building a data repository, it will also demonstrate the integrity of the research. So that these kind of a actually, you know, advocacy strategy you can make to encourage researchers to contribute the data into the systems. Apart from that, I'm giving you one, one of my examples as a researcher. I conducted research on legal information systems in 2015. Uh, it was completed, research was awarded, a like PhD was awarded. But uh, later on, after four years actually, I, one concept came into my mind, why this legal information system is primarily dominated by the males. So th they need to study what is the difference between the female lawyer's perspective and what is the difference between the male lawyer's perspective. So, but luckily data was with me and I could identify the variables to distinguish these two parameters. So. So what you can think when your data is, is in a publishable state, some, if may not, you may not, as a researcher, you may not be able to envisage how you can interpret that data from different, different contexts. But if it is available online, some other people can actually visualize that, that it can interpret in different contexts. So that is another actually strategy we need, need to have. So as a librarian, if I develop, develop my this uh, discussion from a librarian perspective, you need to fit into yourself the concerns of the researchers and the incentives you can provide, like how you can encourage the researchers to deposit the data. Now, if you look into the data sharing trends, uh, in one of the panels uh, I am Liven was sharing and ma'am uh, Shalini was also sharing that management people are not coming forward to deposit the data. So this trend is worldwide actually. If you look into the wireless study, it says, shows that, that uh, Germany is the leading country where there are 55% of the sharing trend occurs, followed by the Brazil, 52%, US, 46%, and the Japan, 45%, and afterwards, uh, UK is a 43%. These are the leading country which are actually, most of them are, the only two are above 50%. So that data sharing trends are same almost everywhere. Uh, but what you need to have is, you need to also think about how you can execute your plan. Technology is not everything. So one of the shloka of uh, Madhva Gita says, Vasan se jirnani yatha vyahai nuvani griti naro prani. So like we are here for some time on the earth. Similarly, technology also has a, uh, you know, uh, time. Over a period of time, technology also changes. So our focus as a librarian, if you look into the fair principle, as a librarian, I don't look the fair principle FAIR. Actually, I look into the fair principle RIAF. So reusable, we should think first, then it, we should look into the interoperability, then we should look, look into the accessibility, and then the findability. So that's a first fundamental actually as a librarian that fair, you, because fair is basically designed by the technologist. But as a librarian, I look into the reverse order. If the data cannot be reused, it has no purpose to po posting on the repository. It has no purpose to make it interoperable. There are a lot of perspective. And in fact, as a librarian perspective, I feel five laws of library science is much better than the fair principle. Because in the file of library science also says these things, books are for use. The data is for use, books are for use. Every reader should get his or her data, isn't it? So that is also interoperability. So that aspect we, we need to look, look into. And when you are actually uh, try to make a research data management system, one major problem is actually it's a top-down approach. But they, 
there if there is a national policy all institution can establish a data repository easily but there are best practices also there are some repositories where there were no national policy there were no institutional policy but they still as could establish a successful data repository in their institution for instance the howard data repositories so if you talk about the howard data repository builders they will tell you that repository was started actually and by encouraging the researcher to demonstrating the benefits of the research data repositories in many ways so this is one aspect uh, that how you can build the data uh, repositories by encouraging and by educating not just from the library side library side but also from the researchers side also you need to educate another aspect is data management planning and in the data management planning there are lots of studies have been done and most of the studies come up with the conclusion that that data management planning is actually a dead documents because researchers forget what they mention in the document so we need to have a comp you know comprehensive research ecosystem where you can not just include your data but also include the data management plan and that ecosystem will actually follow you that what on what, what stage you have to do what in fact uh, one of the study says that in data management plan researcher mentioned that they he, they will share the data uh, and in fact in the end of the research they never share the data with the public so uh, there are several study in fact uh, recently there is a project was started by dart data management plan as a research tool and in which they are trying to build up a actually uh, solution how this problem can be solved i also working on a one of the tools actually as a uh, team member is called uh, dmp tool do to rg which is uh, the project of a california university i am a part of that team and in that team what we did uh, in a dmp tool so dmp tool can also integrate not just with the orchid but it can also uh, integrate with the r space which is a you know comprehensive research ecosystem uh, platform uh, so where you can not include the data from other repositories you can integrate but you can also integrate the dmp tool so researchers simultaneously tracking the research work they can also track what they have mentioned in the dmp that what we they will do with the data in fact the the planning of the data management uh, dmp came from the publisher side when the publishers insisted that that when you will submit the manuscript you also have to submit the data along with it and thereafter the funding agency made it mandatory uh, in the project proposal that you have to include this component but one aspect actually the one of the failures of dmp whole dmp system is that that data management interviews are not being conducted and here comes the role of the librarians that when you actually preparing the dmp tool for the researcher you need to conduct a very comprehensive interview that how you what you will do with the data what are the different formats you will generate so each and every stage actually as a librarian we need to give input to the researchers and that's how we can make this dmp successful so uh, a whole research data management system uh, ecosystem you cannot look into silos all these things are interconnected and dmp is one of them and that can make your project successful so apart from that we also need look into as uh, dr cox said that there are some drivers and there are some influencing sex, uh, you know uh, factors so when you are making the strategies of the library uh, in establishing the data repository you need to actually act between the drivers and influencing factors so your strategy should interlink the drivers factors such as that the, your repository will provide the storage it will provide the security and the trustworthiness the library has created uh, from uh, from, uh, from edges that can also be a one of the driving force and of of course the influencing factors such as acceptance and the uh, incentives data citations visualization all these things governance and skills that can also play a major role into the uh, successful data management system so if you look into the indian scenario when the national data sharing and accessibility policy was notified uh, unfortunately in the policy there is one component and the component is that there are three layers of data one layer is that's open data then we have registered and then we have a restricted data sets but in the policy they have also given that the registered and restricted data can be paid one 
So the institutions who made their data registered and restricted, they can put the pricing into the data sets. So when you actually, uh, I'm sure down the years there will be uh, national data sharing uh, uh, policies for the higher education as well. So if such kind of policies comes up, we need to make sure that this kind of a clauses are not uh, there to make the open science a reality from Indian perspective. So oh, all over the world, the survey which we did and found out that there are, the data repositories are actually the concept generated in the West and mainly the 44% of data repository come from the Europe and the 40% of the repositories are coming from the North America. And only remaining, uh, you can find out that 16% of the repositories are coming from the rest of the world. And the India share, as for the RE3 data, there are only 45 repositories, but there are, you know, two, two dozen other repositories which are not indexed into the system, uh, that registry. And, uh, but one part we are good actually, and that number of open data repositories percentage is more from India compared to the, the, the you know, global data. The global data says there are approximately 60% of the data repositories are open. However, in India, we have around 69% of the data repositories which are open. But unfortunately, in the name of open data repositories, 44% of the data repositories, we cannot actually contribute data into the systems. So that's a, uh, another unfortunate part. And the systems actually which we have created, most of these are, uh, you know, using unknown software, no standard structures are there. So there are lots of problems. Uh, in overall, I can say that uh, the, we are a very formative stage in data repository, but that's not the, actually, it doesn't mean we are lagging behind. Uh, even if, you know, sometimes if you are starting technology late, it has a lot of advantages because you can uh, think about what are the failures happen in the West and lots of things. So this is another data. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, so with this, I think uh, I should rest now. And, uh, um, but there's one more aspect that we no need to consult the, this Western uh, philosophy when we are managing the data. In fact, the Ranganathan philosophy tells us lots of things. So on an average, I already mentioned, on an average one researcher generate one terabyte of the data in the lifespan. So if you will start managing the data, it will be a very Hercules task. So we need to think about the Ranganathan philosophy and Ranganathan says the law of parsimony. So you need to follow the law of parsimony that how you can save the data. So data retention, we have not talked so far. So when people are generating so much of data, data retention policies should also be in place when you are institutions are notifying the data sharing or accessibility policies. So uh, uh, with this, I thank you very much and I will participate uh, in another round. So over to you, thank you. Uh, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rajkumar for sharing your wonderful thoughts. And uh, so you always mentioned and highlighted that in the process of creating uh, or providing research data service, the focus should be more on addressing the concerns of the research. That's a really good value point apart from giving importance to the organizing the data, classifying the data, adding metadata and all of that, I think it's important end of the day, the uh, research data service is for a researcher and through that, if you can really address their uh, you know, concerns, that will be really nice. And you also talked about how LIS professionals can be bring in more value addition in the process of uh, research data services in terms of adding metadata, creating more data and all of that. Uh, it's, it's beautiful to see uh, how you compared, uh, you know, FAIR with FILAS of uh, uh, library science. I think uh, it's really motivating to LIS professionals. I don't feel, you know, uh, surprised if many LIS professionals who are participating here go back from this conference and they may start really, uh, you know, learning more and uh, setting up uh, research data management systems. So with that, we'll move on to the second panelist. Uh, that is uh, Dr. Vishal Rao. Uh, a doctor by profession. He comes from uh, HCG Bangalore. Uh, Dr. Vishal Rao, over to you, sir. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you, sir. At the outset, I would like to thank and congratulate the Samaya University for this wonderful program. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mehta, for inviting me and Dr. Sat Satyanan, sir, for, for uh, 
considering me for this particular panel. Uh, for me, it has been an enlightening one. I've actually never attended one. This is the first one I'm attending. And a lot of learning that I've been, uh, for the last previous session that I've been listening to, very, very enlightening, very eye-opening. And I, I was recollecting a very interesting story. I don't know how many of you all have heard about Lao Tzu, a very famous uh, teacher uh, uh, from the Tao, uh, Taoism. You know, Lao Tzu was a very famous uh, philosopher. So he did something very interesting, and I, I, I was recollecting that. So Lao Tzu was with his two disciples walking in the forest when he ac came across a stream of water. So he sat, meditated for a minute, got up and walked across water. And then seeing this, his senior disciple also sat down, but for a little longer, meditated, and then walked across water. Seeing both of them, the junior most who had just been inducted, was very inspired, meditated for a little more longer. And then as he put his first step into water, he drowned. And Lao Tzu, with his uh, other senior disciple, looked at him from the other side of the lake and said, I think you should tell him where the stones are. So, you know, a very thought-provoking kind of a thing from Lao Tzu. But research today, I think, um, uh, you know, we've combined research with uh, data sciences, and uh, there are two reasons here that I keep pondering. I'm I uh, head I'm the dean of academics for our center of academic research, and I keep telling my my younger colleague students when they come with fellowship programs, theses, research programs, a whole lot of thing that is coming out. Big data, small data. We are talking about artificial intelligence. We are trying to talk about overcoming natural stupidity. And we're looking at a whole gamut of things in this whole bargain. The question will be one aspect is the research aspect and the other aspect is the data management of it. Fundamentally, I think in, in India, and I'm talking about our ecosystems, what I've experienced and working with governments, working with the private sector, working with research, working with innovation. I've looked at data in different data aspects. The, 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 the perspective of data changes as you look at this. Uh, academia, you look at it, uh, you have to, uh, you either publish or perish. Uh, when in industry, you publish and perish because you have to patent it, you know, you cannot do it. So the, the, there is a fundamental divergent philosophy when you approach this whole uh, debate on looking at it. So the data has different connotations in different areas. And as we evolve this, I think the current ecosystem in India, from the way I look at it, is the aspect of research itself has to be redefined and relooked in a more comprehensive manner. I have not, I think that is where we'll need to walk the first mile to get quality data, to get reliable data. And quality research is going to be the precedent to quality data. And that is where a lot of efforts has to be put in across organizations, industry, academia, to bring these ecosystems together to talk about what is it that we are talking about in research today. Even if it is a student's thesis or if it is going to be a published paper, finally, what is the ultimate criteria? And you know, I've, I've just written a paper which uh, is under review right now where we analyze globally the funding for research and development across countries and the productivity of it. We actually wanted to look at how does the world fare and where is India in. So India was, uh, you know, I, I don't have the diagram, but I'll be happy to share that just to tell you all where the, the biggest bubble size was with USA and China, way far ahead. So that means the funding was higher, the corresponding funding for research and development is higher, and the translational part of patents for that and the and the aspect of industrialization or the contribution to economy was very higher. In India, that bubble was very small. The funding was very small, the number of people were very small, but the productivity was very, very uh, significant compared to the number of people. And this is something that I was uh, talking to our state government, telling them that, look, if you can move this bubble, you have to move it forward, you have to make it bigger. You have to do both. It's, not, it's going to be a Herculean task. It's not going to be easy, but both has to be done. And this would have to somewhere start from forums like this. And I'm, I'm taking back a lot of messages today. And again, I would like to congratulate all the organizers. This has been a thought provoking one for me, at least to take back on what is it that I'm going to convey to the, to the 
to the forum that I'm going to be working in because we are here and I was uh, seeing uh, Dr. Cox slide of that 2018 survey where he talks about the top priorities of libraries, which I think 95% of our libraries don't do. Uh, for me, the, the thinking was that if this kind of delivery is what we could do, that is to one, give direction to questions. And, and that's, library is the place where the question is born for, for a researcher. He has to spend his time and that's where the refinement and the curating of the question will happen. And the finer the question, the better the answer. The problem is our questions go wrong because we are trying to cut, copy, paste old questions or Western questions and replicate it here. And that I think is going to be, that has to do with mentorship, guidance, and I think the, the coming years is going to be a much more dynamic change where the librarians may have to play a much more dynamic role to kind of moderate the, the researcher with the guide and actually look at understanding how refinement can be in terms of bringing something productive into this ecosystem. And I think that's where the first step would have to happen. And after that comes the aspect of um, how are you going to manage that data? Because if it's going to be otherwise garbage in, garbage out. And most of this would not make any sense. A lot of the time when I spend time and I go through some of the papers that we've written and look back at it and I, I would really, I encourage my researchers instead of doing that retrospective study, it's better you write a letter to editor. That would be more meaningful and more powerful and changing than compared to doing a study which is going to replicate the same thing that the West has done because you want a publication in another uh, journal, which actually does not translate into anything actionable except for your overall um, uh, list of saying that I have so many publications which, uh, which uh, in, in certain areas, yes, in academic growth helps you. And I think that's something for all of us to ponder upon. And um, if there's any policy recommendations post of post this session, I'd be happy to take it into our governments and and push that forward and say that I think as a collective whole, this particular forum resulted in something, and I'm going to push it forward to our state government. At least uh, that is something that I can uh, stand up with firm conviction and say that I'm going to go back to my state and tell my chief minister, my higher education minister, to say let's change this and let's make a difference. The other aspect that I wanted to, I think, um, add was I was telling uh, Madam, Madam, as we were discussing here about red cap in one of the meetings in the government, I actually came across one of the researchers who was working on red cap, uh, a very democratized uh, form of data from the Vanderbilt University, which talks about data sharing, a very highly sophisticated uh, form of system, which is not open source, but yet is allowing complete data sharing in a much more democratic fashion for research. Very beautiful forum, and I think all of you all should look at it. I think about 155 countries participate in it. Thousands of organizations are participating in REDCap, and um, this this is thanks to COVID. COVID brought all of us together in some strange way, and I was talking to a few of these groups uh, who are a part of REDCap, and I was phenomenally impressed because they were actually giving me data access uh, through REDCap forums to some of the finest data that would have helped me develop something which is so relevant for our people. Not by reduplicating the data, but it's already there. And it was so beautifully analyzed, structured, the metadata that I did not have to redo any study which was pertinent to that region. That is the kind of collaboration that we would need. And India, coming, considering the population, considering the advances, if we are able to put some amount of our energy into collating this data and creating a forum like REDCap for India, I think that would be the game changer that we would have, wherein people can democratically, rather than reduplicating efforts and wasting funds, if these data forums are available where we can share this uh, with reliable data, and that would actually uh, reduce uh, the, the reduplication of efforts and enhance further funding uh, for uh, newer projects and, uh, and maybe innovations also. And I think um, uh, I, I've been pushing uh, very strongly for uh, uh, the clinical scientist program and that's where I've been actually helping our students to look at bridging this entire gap with the, uh, with the, with the future of technologies. Um, and the one thing that I want to share here is 
Uh, if you look at COVID, the one single thing that I can tell about COVID, you know, uh, Winston Churchill, I think when he was talking about World War II, some, told something very interesting about Russia. He said it's a riddle wrapped in a mystery within an enigma, but perhaps there is a key. And uh, COVID was something similar. It gave us some very transformational thinking. I keep telling on a lighter note that, you know, we lost loss of sense of smell, but we also lost common sense during COVID. And uh, one of the most interesting aspects of, of COVID was uh, that it brought us on very interesting platforms for research because everybody started taking research very seriously. And I think uh, this forum, I think we should not let it go because every government today is serious about it. I was talking to somebody, uh, a very senior from uh, the government and, and through this discussion, we were talking on, uh, do you know, um, uh, we've fared decently well through this pandemic, these two years, we've, we are all alive here in this room. And um, that's a proof to say that we've actually done something relevant. So while we were both discussing, um, I asked him this question and I said, do you know why we did so well? And he said to me, he said, I think technology and talent came together. I said, no, I said the 20 powerful people of the world decided that they're going to save the world because presidents and prime ministers got affected. If this was like malaria or typhoid or it was like TB, we would have had another project for 20 years going on. People powerful got affected. And I think that is what showed the world that the power of research could do. If you ask historically, bench to bedside takes about 17 years. This time they created a hyperloop between research and innovation. This did happen this year. And we are at a historic, landmark time. I would say this is a watershed line for research. This particular period is a watershed line for research for data, where if we don't use this for our uh, favor, we are going to miss the bus. We have to use this because this watershed line showed us that bedside, be bench to bedside could be done in 17 hours, 17 weeks also. That is what happened. I was talking to the drug controller and he told me that typically when I signed the first animal study clearance, the fourth drug controller signs the drug. This is the first time that I'm only signing the final drug. That is the pace at which it happened that somebody on a lighter note told me that the, the chimpanzees are waiting for the vaccine because human trials are going on. It was at that speed that uh, the, the environment was changing. So, I mean, this is exciting for us, correct? We, we are at a time when we can actually look at data in such an interesting way. And uh, I think I'm gonna stop at this to say, I think, uh, Satyanan sir, uh, something should come out of this. We should not let it go here. I think what is here and what is being discussed is transformational. We should take it and knock at every door to every institution across this country and tell them about what, what we are talking in these rooms. And again, thank you for inviting me. For me, it's an eye-opener. I think a lot to learn and take back today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Vishal, for uh, talking about various things. and. Uh, so, I mean, we definitely, and also thank you for offering your help to, you know, uh, talk to government and uh, help to do whatever is required to take these things forward. And you also concerned about, you know, it should not be stopped here. So this uh, LTC program is uh, in sixth year. I think all of us are committed. Uh, Satya is, uh, is also more committed to take it forward. And uh, thank you for sharing all your concerns. And uh, before uh, I request uh, the audience to get ready for asking questions, in between we have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Manju Nayaka from IIT uh, Bombay, uh, IIT Mumbai, Bombay. Uh, so I would like to share his uh, thoughts for next uh, 10 minutes. They're slightly running uh, out of time and uh, I would appreciate if uh, Manju can really stick to 10 minutes time. M Dr. Manju, over. Okay. okay, thank you, Dr. Ananda Bhairappa. Uh, Dr. Bhairapa is also one of the tough moderator, like uh, Jima is, probably is not here. I can take one or two minutes. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Let me to thank the organizer for inviting me to share my views on RDM services. This is the last technical session of the three-day event. Hope you have heard several talks, panelists and participants. So I don't know why they put me in the last and also before the lunch. I, I assure you that you will take something new from me. So I have around two decades of experience in academic library. So one thing I would like to say that 
Okay, this is the RDM services and RDM management, this three days event. I'm making a statement as a researcher. India is the fourth largest country in production of scientific literature. And naturally, this is the fourth largest, more or less, in production of research data. So uh, assuming that I am publishing this, okay, this statement or this uh, insight in a paper or in a conference proceedings, I am saying that. So either I have taken a funding for this work or just it's my voluntary research. Normally what research publication they will do, they will publish the short publication. They don't have a time to publish the entire story of my research work. They ask us, you give a data. So now what I need to give data? So how many research uh, paper has been published all over the world, the country-wise, the year-wise? Then they have uh, derived this statement, so India is the fourth largest. The supporting document, the publisher are asking, you deposit it somewhere that is publicly available for validation. This is what a library is supposed to do. Either we need to host the data, or we need to ask the user where like a fix here or GitHub or wherever is public domain repository is available to deposit the data. This is the main important, okay, some of the doubt which I cleared about RDM service by the library. Either you can host it or you can uh, refer the other user to host the data. This is immediate requirement of the funding agency as well as the publisher. Second thing is that in India, so as I said, fourth largest, as a user, you might have several queries, which is the first country. So what is the number of India's? What is the first country number of publication? My, my intention is not to give all those, but my data has answer to all those questions. So you can query the data. Publisher are not hosting, fund agency are not hosting. So library is hosting that data, or library is helping the research support services. Second thing is that in India, whether it take a patent publication, a research publication, thesis and dissertation, most more than 90% of these are produced by public funded institution in India. Take example for this event is organized by two or private organization. Okay, we assume that, so several other speakers also said, there is no demand for research data from the user, from the researcher. It shows that neither government organization is interested, nor researcher are interested. They are not demanding, they may use it if you give. So there are uh, champions or volunteers, those who are interested in this area, they are advocating this open science or open access data. But there are some challenges I will share with you why some of the funding agency, particularly government organizations, are not sharing that research data. The third point which I want to make you is that uh, I think the vice chancellor of this university has asked the one question, how many of Indian universities are giving a skill to handle this RDM services? I, I feel that this survey, this area is completely not completely new. Library community has learned a lot of the basic knowledge about handling the information, the golden, the functions of libraries, acquire it, organize it, disseminate, and archive it. So this we are doing irrespective of the item type. Research data is a one more item. So I'm thinking whether we failed as a library community or information science community while well, defining the digital library or digital library uh, system, whether we have not handled this research data in a small way, okay, whether it's interview data, whether it's a sample data, whether it's a software code or anything in print era, so we have described it, we have disseminated it, we have archived it. But today we are talking about research data in a big data way so what we are talking is not in a GB or MB. We may require the storage in a petabytes, in exabytes, but we need to think about, are we going from digital library to data library setup? Are we going from information services to data services, from information center to data center? So what skills are required? We need to think about it 
in a uh, in a discipline uh, we should clear this doubt so w what is our role here so i will tell you from iit bombay perspective the data i am not talking about unstructured data the data which uh, has no value because the data which is publicized in the form of thesis or dissertation or patent or uh, any other things which has some peer review process supported daku data is required for that at iit bombay we have a uh, data sets of last more than 22 years data the data is not available in open access mode but we never deny it to anybody whether within the institute or within the country or outside the country uh, you may ask you why we didn't share the data particularly public funded uh, universities in india they are facing the huge fund crunch so they, are, they they have been asked to generate the fund to manage your university so when uh, the data collected okay at the whatever may be library or computer center or anything uh, all the research data this data has become a corpus there is a, a expert committee which evaluate or which evaluate it to identify the ipr related or patentable okay works from there they generate a money so in case if you make it the entire data in a open access immediately after publication you will get it around 1000 publication by other people in india particularly the what we call as a substandard publications so this is the one the area which we need this is not a cultural issues within the institute but we need to think outside so how this data is being used the second thing is that why data is not shared at particularly premier institute is that so when why you know, somebody from uh, a private agency or international agency and particularly management people they are giving a research works to the iit uh, because they have expertise they are giving a product or solution when they are giving a money when they are giving the work but definitely these people have a non disclosure agreement so you cannot thank you yeah thank you yeah you cannot okay disclose any part of this data because we have agreed to the terms and condition uh, i answered some of okay most of the people were asking the question why they are not sharing the data these are two so second reason for that why they are not sharing the data they are taking some sensitive research work particularly drdo the isro there are some other okay confidential or sensitive research work that at any cost okay between two people okay that never be disclosed for anything to uh, outside uh, these two people so another the last point uh, which i want to share with you uh, about particularly research and data uh, management aspect is that so now today uh, we are using a, a system for for archive we are using omeka open source system which contains about IIT Bombay entire history. Probably uh, uh, very less people are interested to know about the uh, history of IIT, but most of the Western people are using the data, which we recently launched it. It contains about more than uh, 60,000 images, reports, etc. This is completely done by library. We have not taken any support from either external agency or expert from computer science, etc. And we have a repository, the D space, which can which take care about open access, uh, the content of the publication. Again, we are using open source software. We are using again Koha for library management system. Now we want to use for data works for uh, research data management system. So uh, expecting the librarian to learn all, all these uh, diff different item, item types, uh, different uh, uh, system which is a little bit uh, really uh, your expectation is high on the library community also. Library community, don't worry about handling the research data. If, when you are handling information, definitely you can handle the research data. The only we need to provide is that we need to set up a RDBMS. That is what yesterday Biswanath was telling that we are not, library community is not worry about RDS. We are worrying about managing a relational database management system. This is where we need to set up the system and remaining things 
yeah, people will take care about. This is a continuous process. When data is produced, for example, one, the average, uh, one researcher uh, spends around five, six years at IIT Bombay, maximum six years. The six years, m the more than, okay, 10 GB data they are producing. Uh, calculated for 3,500 research scholar are there. Around close to 700 faculty are there. Uh, you need yearly storage uh, is around uh, in te uh, petabytes. Uh, you mm -hmm. have, uh, people will say, some people will loosely, are what is there in the library data to take care about security? Are we m managing the uh, financial data like a banking? So I will tell you, this is not an easy job to run this, all this system 24 bar 7. And most of the software we are using not proprietary, open source software. Most of the open source of software are vulnerable, particularly for security issues. Yeah, so anytime anybody is hacking, but we don't have a people like a big organization where a lot of people are watching who is doing what in the system. But in our case, we are not watching. But one person is enough to spoil the entire institute network by injecting a virus. So the, the security, data security is the most important, whether it is a publication, whether bibliographic data, the citation data. Sir, data. Sorry to interrupt you. Can you? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. These this are all my points. Okay. Thank you very much. So thank you very much uh, for sharing your views and uh, uh, also giving uh, your experience at uh, IIT Mumbai. Uh, with the interest of time, I think uh, uh, I prefer to uh, you know, uh, ask the participants to ask questions first, uh, whatever is there. Then uh, if time permits, then we can ask one or two questions to, to uh, the panelists. Uh, with the permission of the uh, you know organizers, I would like to switch over to audience uh, for asking questions to panelists. My the question comments, to uh, questions. Dr. Bharat Raj that uh, as you are uh, as you told us that you are uh, connected with that art space community and uh, uh, i want to know how you are managing the data set versioning for example in github and gitlab we are managing software versions similarly a data sets may have many versions when you walk so that versioning control of data set how you are managing there any idea uh, this is slightly different actually, uh, managing the data. So there are various aspects of data management like as a researcher's point of view I'm sharing. Like uh, if I'm a researcher and I want to share my data with the public, so there are two aspects into it. One aspect is that I will deposit my data with a discipline specific people. So I will share the data in a discipline specific repositories. But uh, there are several discipline specific repositories which allows us to create the account and deposit the data and but the other aspect is that i want to share my data with a wider audience where there are interdisciplinary uh, approaches or also there because there are many aspects like i'm sharing because the here the data is not important the story behind the data is important so the researcher i'm i'm giving you answer as a researcher so researchers make story out of the data and I'm giving one example. Recently, we were working on a open access research, the India contribution to open access research. And I was collaborating with uh, one of the teachers in LIS department in AMU. And he collected the data. He's a researcher, collected the data. And we came up uh, with some findings and tables. And uh, we found that this is the India's research and these are the policies. But suddenly, there was another data set I had with me. And the data set says that this is the age of the researchers who are publishing LIS research from India. And that data set is, uh, Aurora sir is here, I should not mention it. The Vidwan gives us actually the date of, uh, you know, birth of various, you know, researchers through the Vidwan, you can find out the years. So I fetched the data from the Vidwan and that we data we actually, uh, you know, mapped and we created another table and we find out that this is the age and this is the publications coming from the young researcher and these are the senior researchers. So the data, story behind the data is important and there are just uh, discipline specific repository and there are gen generic repositories. Like uh, there are four generic repositories are very popular nowadays and I'm, I've been using like Figshare is one of them which has a lot of facilities. And how Figshare gives you the researchers, the ownership of the data is that you can make your data public or private at any point of time. If you want to make it private, you can just click on 
button and you can make it private. It will not be shared with others. And if you want to make it public, you can. And that these repositories, which are generic in nature, empower the researcher so much that you can also link the other data sets. Like if you want to make story with a different data set, you can link between. There are version controlling also. You can also link the data management plan along with it. And they support almost all type of formats. So here is the story actually. Do we need to establish our own repository which we would not be able, may not be able to or might not be able to update on a very periodic basis? Or do we need to use the repository which already exists? There are backing behind it. There are people who are updating on a continuous basis. So that's actually the takeaway we can have from this conclave, whether to start the data repository at this time to manage the personal data, or we should use the existing infrastructure uh, to manage our data sets. I hope I answer your question, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rajkumar. And uh, with that, we'll go to the second question, please. Good afternoon to one and all. Uh, hi, this is Prahlad, uh, working in an industry as an associate director, one of the top most law firm, Ketan and Company. My question to Raj, as he had done a couple of uh, research in the legal domain, uh, how you compare RDM, uh, RDM in academic and RDM in corporate? Because uh, uh, from last three days, what I am witnessing, the data, 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 definitely, but data in academic sense and data in corporate sense, uh, uh, there are a slightly difference. So can you guide how we can, as a corporate, how we can we implement RDM in corporate sectors? Uh, definitely there is a knowledge management system, there is a DSpace institutional repository, but how specifically RDM can be implemented in the corporate sector? Just one or two points, so, one or two insights. Uh, yeah. uh, it's a slightly difficult because I so far I not, never worked in a corporate sector. I worked in a government academic, uh, you know, teaching uh, librarians and government as well. Uh, but uh, and the various projects also. But as far as my understanding is concerned, data in a corporate sector actually is a very diverse in nature. So diverse in the sense, if you go into the uh, the IT corporate sector, the the application they generate that is also kind of a data. So managing the application can also be one part there, a different uh, application they, they manage and then they make the big software. And I'm giving you one of the example. Uh, several years ago, actually, uh, Shalini Ma'am is responsible for that. We had visited the Honeywell in Bangalore. So Honeywell, uh, what they were doing, they were managing the codes of their small, small applications. And when they had a uh, request from the client to make a bigger program, so they used to, instead of creating the application from the scratch again, they used to use the existing application to make the bigger program. So that kind of a mechanism you can have in IT corporate sector, I'm sure, but you are working in a legal information. So legal information is the data is a very sensitive in nature, like the evidence you generate, that the data from the legislative processes. So you can categorize the legal uh, research data into two parts, legislative as well as the legal. Uh, aspects. And then you have to make a relationship between the legislative and the legal uh, informations. And that kind of a uh, mechanism is itself is a research data. So because legal information you cannot uh, see into the silos. The legal and legislative you have to look together actually to make the uh, research data uh, systems in the corporate sector. I hope I address it. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rajkumar. Uh, I can also share my experience. I worked in GE for about 20 years and uh, in corporates. What uh, matters to them is, you know, they look at uh, uh, the confidentiality and the, uh, you know, uh, classification of the data and publications. For example, in GE, uh, GE was, uh, you know, filing for about 3,000 per year. They were publishing about 500 papers. There was a clear cut policy in place that every piece of information you want to publish outside or share outside, that will go through the classification process. For example, every one over one manager will look at your data or a publication, whatever is that, and their job is to classify that information or that publication based on the sensitivity of the content in that. So based on the sensitivity, we, they had a policy to classify documents into four levels. One is public, it means there is no confidentiality information. It can go outside. Second is internal. There is something, for example, flowcharts kind of a thing, uh, you know, arc charts and all of that. 
So generally, GE prefer to retain them for internal public employees only. Uh, third was uh, the uh, confidential, and uh, that information when you classify as a confidential, author is supposed to give the reader list or the people who can really have access to that based on the technology they are working and who can really do that. But at the same time, somebody, some other employee from different country, if they wanted to access, there is always uh, you know somebody who is uh, owner of that publication who can grant permission. And that permission was given to the technology leader for the highest. The fourth level was, uh, you know, uh, restricted in the sense. Say, for example, you come out with a paper and you ask people to really go and uh, do a presentation in the conference. You may not get permission. Because somebody may see in the approval process that they, this document has a patentability stuff. So once you publish, you know, you may lose uh, the, you know, uh, uh, you may create the prior art so that you know you lose the you know, chance of getting the patent. So processes are important. Corporates are best examples in this world to really see how they really classify the content, how they control the content. In academics, it's very difficult. In fact, we don't really bother about uh, the classification of the content. Corporates generally, before they give out any piece of information, they thoroughly look at that, you know, content, they classify that, they clearly you know, define what to do, what not to do kind of thing. That way there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you know, corporates work very differently compared to the academics. So I hope uh, I brought in a little uh, uh, clarity and um, maybe with the interest of time, we can take one last question. Yeah. Uh, I think this is an interesting uh, discussion debate that's going on about uh, uh, the uh, data from the private sector needs privacy or openness. Uh, in this context, uh, I think uh, I would like Dr. Vishal Rao to throw some light because the health is uh, a sector which is significantly in the private sector domain, but the health sector is something which protects the public interest. So you work for the public interest entirely, but you are, uh, predominantly the investment comes from the private sector. How is it balanced? How is the whole uh, research data management balance there? It's availability or reusability, whatever else. Uh, so can you throw some light on that? So as of now, if you look at the structure of research, first of all, the ecosystem of research in the private sector is not encouraged. So that itself is the weak link. And that is where I believe that, that the new ecosystems of either research or innovation has to be brought in into the into the aspects of mandates so that every clinician everything now data need not uh, be driven only by research sometimes data could just be an a collection in continuum which need not which may be analyzed by somebody else and that's where uh, today a lot of private organizations are trying to collaborate with academia industry and that's where the topic of academy industry is coming because maybe a clinician in a private sector may not be interested in that particular data but he's generating so much of data but that could be very useful for an academia and that could eventually be useful for larger policies or anything and this kind of an interconnectivity is today not there and that is where every organization should aspire to do this kind of a data pool connectivity which is being generated minute by minute, but getting wasted in continuum. So whether it is creation of the data, whether it is storage, or whether it is after that it's collation, analysis, other things, it's a very dynamic process. It's not a one-time process. A lot of the times when we look at this thing, we're looking at, especially in health, it's not a one-time data. It's a dynamic longitudinal process that, that also needs to be done, which moves with dynamically with the patient. And that's what we are studying with genomics today. We are studying with microbiomes today that in the current environment, this is changing dynamically, minute to minute, hour to hour, and years to years. So we are now doing biobanks, we are doing storage of blood tissues, too, because the same person today is okay. 10 years from now, he may have diabetes. 20 years from now, he may have cardiac disease. And 30 years from so this is such a dynamic process. So for a person to look at it, it is also going to be important time point wise to study that same data, because that same data today may be different. So coming years would require academy industry collaboration and that's what I think government of India is pushing very strongly 
because otherwise the private sector which is not having the scientific temperament to do research may say that this is not relevant for me and how do we build such an ecosystem where we partner and ensure that this mandate is given is something that we will have to look forward to. Uh, with the permission of Anand, even though he said that is the course. last question, I just want to add here, somewhere along the way, I think people have lost the connect with the theme of the conference or theme. We are not talking about data management here. It's about research data management, number one. That was kind of missed out when somewhere along the way, number one. Number two, when we are talking about research data management, research, the way it is conducted, the way it is managed or rather published, etc., it's similar both in academia as well as in industry. Because the industry, I mean, very large corporations, etc., invest in industry, I mean, sorry, invest in research, okay? So, for I mean, I'm just taking an, one example, that's not the only example because that is with whom I have worked with, okay? Microsoft Research, for example, is there in Bangalore. The way Microsoft Research, that unit of Microsoft Research, uh, Microsoft works is very different from the way Microsoft works because it is the same similar academic, you know, culture is there when it comes to publication, when it comes to attending conferences, sharing their papers, etc., etc. So academic culture is there even in the industry where they have a separate research way. That's one point I wanted to highlight. And it is not very different. Whether it is Yahoo, Google, or Microsoft, or whatever research organization you take, they all attend conferences, they all attend the research. If it is patenting, it's a different part. Intellectual property has a different thing. So we are talking about research. That's what I'm trying to highlight, research data management. The third point that I want to address, uh, or rather comment on uh, Anand's uh, comment about corporates have uh, confidentiality, academia do not have. Academia does not have confidentiality only for academic part of it. But when it comes to certain part, for example, examination, you know, you cannot compete with universities when it comes to confidentiality in examination. So there is a confidentiality when it comes to certain part of the work, which is examination, results, question papers, and things, etc. which even if I have set the question paper, I cannot share it. I would be put behind bars if I share the question paper just because I am a paper setter. So there are different, so we don't lose sight of the fact that we are talking about research data management. That's all I wanted to have. Thank you, madam. Uh, I would like to add to that industrial, uh, you know, organization GE also into the list. In Bangalore, John F. Hills Technology Center, there are 500 plus PhDs who are working to do industrial research. They get and they do all of that. So my examples came from there. And uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, the interactive discussion. It's a lot of insightful. Uh, I would like to be thankful for uh, very insightful, wonderful panelists we have. And we got many insights, many examples and many takeaways and also uh, audience for adding a uh, lot of comments and questions. I think together, undoubtedly this session, you all made it as a very learning kind of a thing. And I would like to also thank uh, Satya and uh, uh, Dr. Shalini Madam for adding their views and making it more meaningful. And uh, before we end, you know, I would like to say one or two things. Uh, so in IIC a couple of years back formally, uh, we started uh, Office of Data, but the intention behind starting uh, Office of Data was uh, ranking agencies, actually, you may laugh at it, uh, because there were a lot of data required for many ranking agencies. There was no organized effort, you know, how difficult it is to get uh, the uh, required data in bigger organizations. So from that point of view, we added, and uh, fortunately, unfortunately, I was the first head of, uh, uh, for two years, and we did a lot of work. We worked with internal systems to pull out data, what we want. We automated that and all. Now we are actually getting into uh, formal research uh, data management services uh, kind of a thing. Uh, so, but we did two things at IIC uh, from a data management point of view. Uh, one is, uh, you know, uh, as I said, we try to really institutionalize the, you know, uh, the uh, classification, I don't say confidentiality, classification of internal data. Generally in corporates, we don't, we don't really bother too much about organizing and classifying and, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
putting the data in order, putting the publications. We came out with, uh, you know, same four level uh, method what we used in corporates. It was very well received by our uh, leadership. But however, uh, we are yet to really institutionalize that process. And the second piece we try to address, which is incomplete now is, you know, when it comes to data, uh, research data, the standards are really yet to come out because still uh, in the initial stage, we, we use, when it comes to standards, we use from uh, other areas like, you know, uh, uh, whatever we our sp speaker spoke. Then we tried an experiment of uh, doing, uh, using, uh, you know, DOI plus adding something uh, to the data sets. So that way, I mean, since uh, from the classification point of view, we thought there is a need for uh, looking at differently and come out with some kind of a scheme uh, which people can really accept. But as I said, this work in progress and uh, eventually we may work on that. Uh, so that's the kind of uh, one incomplete uh, program. Uh, with these uh, comments, I would like to thank uh, Satya, Professor Shalini and uh, all of you for patiently hearing us and making this session interactive. Thank you very much. Uh, may I request Dr. Vaidandi to come on stage for the felicitations of panelists? Uh, I request, sir, to felicitate Dr. Rajakumar Bharadwaj. Thank you, sir. Uh, I request, sir, to felicitate Dr. Vishal Rao. Thank you, sir. Now I request, sir, to felicitate Dr. Manju Naika. Uh, 